The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Salvation, Then Sanctification. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for the great deliverance which thou hast wrought for us in dying for us on the cross, and for the great deliverance which thou hast wrought in us by joining us to Christ in the power of his resurrection. Bless the truth to each heart in this hour, and may it lay hold upon our minds and hearts, and bring us into the freshness and vigor of daily triumph in our Lord. Bring conviction to any who have not been born again, and growth to all who have become thy children in Christ, through whom to thee be all praise and glory in his name and for his sake. Amen. We are studying in the Epistle to the Romans, and today we read in the seventh chapter three verses, verses four to seven. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now, we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now we return after a large amplification of the illustration of marriage to a consideration of the narrative in its doctrinal flow. Our text begins with the words, Wherefore, my brethren. The word brethren, as we saw in the first verse, limits this passage primarily to the early believers who were Jewish Christians for Paul states that he was speaking to them who knew the law. There was no knowledge of the law, for the references to the law of God, in any who were outside the tribes of Israel. The Roman law had no provisions whatsoever which bound a man and a woman to each other for finality, and the Lord was certainly not setting forth doctrine on the grounds of man-made law. The introductory word, wherefore, ties the doctrinal teaching which follows to the example which precedes. The illustration has been that of a Jewish wife who was bound to her Jewish husband as long as he lived. But if and when he died, according to the Mosaic law, she was freed from the law and could be married to another man. If, on the contrary, she was separated from a living husband and joined to another man, she was an adulteress. Now, says the apostle, the children of Israel had been married to the law of Moses, and this marriage had been valid and binding till the moment when the Lord Jesus Christ died. But at that moment, God took the law and nailed it to the cross, and thus men were freed from the mastery of the law. At the moment Christ died and the law with him, Israel became a widow so far as the law was concerned and could now be joined to the risen Lord Jesus Christ who would furnish the life, the power, and the joy of the new union. The commentators have differed widely on the full meaning of this passage, some of them attempting to apply it to all believers, and some limiting it to those who had been circumcised and brought up under the provisions of the law of Moses. Now we believe that beyond question the passage refers to non-Gentiles, though there can be a good spiritual application for those of us who were born outside of the racial covenant, which had been made with the seed of Abraham. The whole chapter is intended to show that believers in Christ are not under the law. In the previous chapter, we had set forth, ye are not under the law, ye are under grace. And the positive truth was emphasized, and the nature of grace fully stated. Now the negative side is to be presented. And believers, both Jew and Gentile, are to be told in no uncertain terms that they are not under any system of law. Let us summarize the teaching of this epistle thus far with reference to the law of Moses. In the second chapter of Romans, we saw in some detail that the existence of the Mosaic law had not enabled the children of Israel to produce positive righteousness, which could be acceptable to God. In the third chapter, the same declaration was made for the Gentiles. In the strongest terms, it is averred that righteousness could never be produced by human character or any attempt to provide good works by human effort. All that the law could do was to produce the knowledge of sin. 
The law was not an exhibition of the righteousness of God and no part in the manifestation of divine righteousness. For the righteousness of God is manifested only in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the law is no more than a witness to this righteousness. This we read in 321. The same chapter closed with the thought that the existence of the law, perfect as it was, and unattainable as were its demands, could not prevent man from boasting that he had lived up to it, or at least was not doing too badly by it. The fourth chapter set forth that the law had no connection whatsoever with all the promises of grace which had been made to Abraham and which had been given to him without any legal conditions whatsoever. And in the same connection, it was declared that the law worked wrath and the context showed it that this was by the abounding of offenses. Men were, of course, living as sinners. But when God spelled out the law, covering every phase of the life of man, it was shown in all of these phases that man was a transgressor, thus increasing the offenses and the condemnation and bringing in the reign of death over man. Now, when the epistle to the Romans was first read in the capital city of the world, it came to an assembly of believers largely composed of Jews living there in Rome. And such a view of the law as set forth in these first chapters must have brought some degree of consternation to those who heard it. Not only to those who had been brought up under the provisions of the law, but also to the Gentiles who had become closely associated with them and who had learned that Israel had a much higher standard of morality than anyone living in the pagan world and who had learned to associate that superior human righteousness with the divine law that had been given through Moses, and under whose provisions they themselves were attempting to live. It was therefore very necessary for Paul to show them all that they were not in any wise bound to that law or under its condemning restrictions. This was all the more true because he had appealed to the very scriptures which set forth the law in order to show that justification was by faith alone, using the lives of Abraham and David to demonstrate this. What he now sets forth is therefore of the greatest comfort to all, whether Jew or Gentile, because of the fact that man is so prone to do something for himself and to attach some value to that which he has done. And this is all the more important because almost every phase of Christendom has reverted to some system of law works. The Reformation at the time of the Renaissance, while it brought believers out of one bondage, brought them back under the bondage of the Mosaic law in large measure. For the church came out of the Middle Ages like Lazarus from the tomb at the resurrection call of the Lord Jesus. Alive, but bound in grave clothes and needing the call of the Lord, loose him and let him go. The reformers took away one change of linen bindings, smelling of the tomb, but bound the believers with another change of bindings, which has atrophied the spiritual life of multitudes. The seventh chapter of Romans may be divided into three sections, which take up three great principles, which have been enunciated in earlier chapters and explains them more fully. In chapter three and verse 20, it was announced that by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. It will now be set forth that by the new union with Christ in grace, good deeds shall be produced in the believer. In chapter 5 and verse 20, it was announced that the law entered that the offense might abound. It will now be set forth that in spite of this horrible byproduct of the law, the law is in itself not sinful, but holy, just, and good. In chapter 6 and verse 14, it was announced that the believer would not be dominated by sin. It will now be set forth how the conflict with sin in the life of the believer shall be resolved in triumph. Our text now proclaims that our union with Christ under the figure of the second marriage is in order that we might bring forth fruit unto God. The purpose of all this doctrinal teaching is the life of holiness in the believer. It is therefore of paramount importance to each and every one who names the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. From the rest of the scripture, we understand that while our entrance into heaven is dependent entirely on the redemptive work of the Savior in dying in our place on the cross, our place in heaven 
is dependent upon our fulfillment of the truth set forth in this verse. Christ was judged for our sins, but we shall be judged on the basis of how we have allowed grace to work in us. It is impossible, therefore, to give too much importance to the truths which we find in this chapter. What you are in heaven forever depends upon your understanding and realization of these truths. Getting into heaven, of course, depends upon the blood of Christ. But I repeat, what you are in heaven depends upon your understanding and realization of the truths which we are now considering. To say with our text that the fruitage of the Christian life is an outgrowth of our union with Christ in resurrection grace is to declare that sanctification follows justification and must not be confused with it. I'm beginning to believe that this truth is so important that it would not be amiss to affirm it in every sermon that could be preached and set it forth in every Bible study. Here's the definition. Justification is that act of God whereby he declares an ungodly man to be perfect while he is still ungodly. Sanctification is that work of God whereby he takes the wholly justified man and begins to form him in the likeness of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. To mix any type of legalism with sanctification is a denial of the whole truth. To hold the believer to any code of law is to turn his acts of Christian living into efforts of character instead of fruits of grace. The results in two believers who live side by side, but who may hold different mental and spiritual attitudes towards this problem, may appear to be the same and probably are the same in the sight of men, of unsaved men. But in the sight of God, the prayers, the Bible reading, the devotions of a Christian who is striving in the power of the flesh to fulfill the demands of some code, whether derived from the Bible or no, are tinged with that which must bring them to rejection by him. The feeblest successes, on the other hand, in the life of the one who has flung himself utterly on the grace of God, are counted of great worth and alone can be acceptable to him. The stumbling, halting Christian life that is based on grace and grace alone is more acceptable to God than the life much more righteous by human standards that is produced to conform with a legal standard and by the mortifying of the flesh apart from the cross of Jesus Christ. In passing, it should be pointed out that herein lies the reason why Paul was able to write to the Corinthians, that he was not in the slightest concerned of the opinion of others about his life and actions, that he judged nothing before the time of the Lord's judgment, and that he didn't even rely upon his own judgment of himself. For the spiritual application of this passage to all believers, we can do no better than refer to a paragraph by Griffith Thomas, who confesses himself indebted to Godet, Gifford, and others. The wife in the illustration, he says along with these other commentators, may be said to be that inmost self or personality, which is the same under all conditions of existence, the I myself. The first husband is our old man, chapter 6 and verse 6, our unregenerate self. And as long as he was alive, we were under his law. The death of the first husband is the crucifixion of the old man with Christ, he says. The wife, set free through her first husband's death, and therefore become dead to the law of that husband, is the soul set free by the crucifixion of the old man, and thereby made dead to its law. And this soul set free has no other law than that of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. The contrast between the first union with death in the law, and that of the second union Life in the risen Christ is most evident. While we were living in the flesh, the text says, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the spirit. Thomas concludes, it is necessary to beware of thinking that the apostle uses the illustration inaccurately as though in the illustration the husband dies and the woman lives, while in the spiritual application the wife dies and the husband lives. 
This is to confuse matters entirely. And it's unnecessary as it is impossible if only we will allow the apostle to guide us step by step. We may surely believe that he knew what he was doing in using this simile. Any intelligent explanation of the illustration requires that what the first husband represents should correspond to what the second is. And we know that the second represents Jesus Christ. It would therefore be altogether incongruous to speak of a woman as having for her first husband an impersonal law and for her second a living person. Now, I believe that both of these explanations may be drawn from the same illustration. How much richer the whole passage becomes if we see that it is a two-edged sword. It First, the illustration applies to those who are born and brought up under the Mosaic law, married to that law which is done away when Christ dies, so that Israel might be joined to the grace that is in the risen Messiah. Then, having set forth this fact with its limited interpretation to Israel, the apostle applies it again to every member of the body of Christ, Jew or Gentile, showing that our union with sin in the flesh is broken by the sovereign act of God in counting our old man to be federally joined to Christ in his death, as we have seen in our study of the sixth chapter, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be annulled, that we might no longer be in bondage to sin. For the person who has died, as we have with Christ, is justified from sin. Now, if we look back over the last chapter, we will discover that three times Paul asked questions in form that indicate that the most elementary knowledge of Christ should have given the answers. What? Know ye not? Know ye not? Know ye not? All three have reference to the great doctrine that God counts all true believers as being one with Christ, seen by the Father to be alive in Christ, seen by the Father to be perfect in Christ, seen by the Father to be freed from all power other than that of the risen Christ. In answer to the terrible question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He replies with the question, do you not know all of you who were identified with Jesus Christ, who were once made one with him in his death? And therefore, because of that oneness, the old life of sin is impossible because of that oneness with Christ. Now, in answer to the second terrible question, shall we sin because we are not under the law? He replies with the question, do you not know that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Therefore, because of that oneness with Christ, the old slavery becomes impossible. Finally, he asks the third question. And like the others, it seems to be in a tone of voice which implies that even a baby Christian should know this. What, says he, do you not know that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth, and that a woman is free to remarry when her husband dies? Therefore, because of the new conditions, the old man is impossible. Now put these three verses together, and we find that the old life gives place to the new. The old slavery gives place to the new obedience. And the old marriage is dissolved in order that the new union with Christ might come into being. Or if we consider these three questions and their answers from another point of view, we find that the truth is sharply presented in the three contrasts. First, the two heads, Adam and Christ, in chapter 5. Second, the two masters, sin and Christ, in chapter 6. And third, in this seventh chapter, two husbands the law with our old carnal nature, and the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It sometimes seems to me that Satan and the flesh wage their great warfare in the field of morals in order to break down the strength of the truth that is presented here. There are those who laugh at Puritan ideas and Victorian ideals, but they have this in their favor. Those who lived in those times had a higher respect for marriage than exists in our day. When the old romantic ideals prevailed in literature, when a knight would die for the honor of his lady, when marriage was held in highest esteem, when divorces were practically non-existent, then people could understand the depths of the example of marriage as an illustration of our oneness with Christ. But when a civilization like ours 
begins to exploit sex on half the pages of our magazines, on our billboards, on our television shows, when most of the radio jokes are about sex, plunging necklines and the like, when almost every article of commerce is put on sale by advertising the body of a woman, when the divorce rate climbs fantastically and the often married stars are the centers of attraction, when unthinking mothers will name their babies for these same heroines of dissolution, then there is little standard for comparison with holy things. Obedience is removed from the marriage vows as though to symbolize the disobedience of men to the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom they should be joined, and the way to apostasy has been made easy. Now it's been well over a century since the older Marcus Rainsford wrote a paragraph about our text which exalts the holiness and wonder of our marriage with Christ, union with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. I quote it not only to illustrate our text, but to show by the very nature of the language which he uses and the contrast between his style and that of writers of today that the church is in an age of coldness and that we need to return to our first love, lest the Lord remove our candlestick. Let faith ring these bells of heaven for joy, he writes, married to Christ, himself the measure of our responsibilities, himself the fullness of our capabilities, himself the possessor of our heart's affection, himself the security of our hopes, himself the wellspring of our fruitfulness, himself the law of our hearts, our glory and our crown. Oh, blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And may we afresh take the marriage vows that bind us to our Lord, and forsaking all others, cleave unto him in steadfast faithfulness, as he will cling to us. And we pray thee, our God and Father, that the Holy Spirit will take this message to each heart, use it steadfastly in thyself to bring us closer to thee. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.